Tonight, Hollywood is the scene of a gala event unusual even for Hollywood. The world premiere of Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Rarely has Hollywood been so agog over the opening of a motion picture. The town's been talking about it for months. Practically the entire movie colony will be at the opening tonight, and you're going along too. So we take you to the Carthay Circle Theater for the premiere of Walt Disney's full-length Technicolor production, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And now here's, uh, here's a gentleman that I'm sure you'll all want to meet. It's Walt Disney, the creator of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And he's just arrived. Mr. Disney, will you come up, please? Well, I'm very happy about everything. Well, Walt, I, I think you're due to do all the talking tonight. Uh, tell us a little bit about this picture, will you? Well, uh, it's been a lot of fun making it. And we're very happy that it's being given this big premiere here tonight. And all these people are turning out to... To take a look at it, and I hope they're not too disappointed. Well, I'm sure they won't be. I've seen the picture, Walt, and you're going to be congratulated. Here's an interesting fact. Out of all the movies that he had produced, Walt Disney only showed up to the premiere of just two of them. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and Mary Poppins. The reason his appearances for those moments were so rare was because of his never-endingly busy schedule, like working on cartoons, or later with his other features, TV shows, and Disneyland. Then again, movie premieres are rarely worth noting to a film's significance outside of the first reactions to the complete picture. When it comes to Disney's second feature, Pinocchio, that seems like it would be a similar case. From what's usually written in the history books, the movie received great praise since its first appearance on the silver screen, and some even stated at the time that it was better than Snow White. However, keep in mind that the key word to what I said before was that it seems like it. Across many of these official records, none of them ever mention what happened during the premiere, and with good reason. In fact, this is a story that Disney would rather that people forget about. A moment in their history that was very, um, un-Disney. Like the kind in which alcohol was involved. And the records to what happened can be said to be buried deep in the Disney vaults. Almost next to Song of the South. To put it in clickbait terms, this is the wildest moment in Disney's history that no one knows about. Or at least, very few do. So, what happened during the premiere of Pinocchio? Well, let's find out. Now, before we look into that fateful day, let's begin our story with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. After its wide release in early 1938, the film was one of the biggest successes of its time in every way. Beloved by critics and audiences by being called a cinematic innovation, it was a box office hit so big that it once held the title of the highest grossing sound film of all time, and even its merchandising sold millions during a time when movie-based merch was a new concept. Of course, a big part of its success is thanks to the unforgettable Seven Dwarves, with their standout performances, comedic antics, and kind heart as they protect Snow White from the evil queen, they immediately became a fan favorite amongst audiences, especially with children. <laughs> Then, a year and a half later, Hollywood managed to make lightning strike twice thanks to The Wizard of Oz, where the success of that film was strikingly like Snow White's, which was partly thanks to Walt Disney himself giving a helping hand to the MGM producers. Same critical praise, same type of box office hit, even some of the same merchandising results. And in a strange coincidence, The Wizard of Oz also had fan favorite dwarves that kids adored. This time though, they were the Munchkins, especially with how they helped revolutionize movies by filling Munchkin Land with vibrant colors. In the name of the Lollipop Kid, we wish to welcome you to Munchkin Land. As a result, both films sparked a phenomenon in the late 1930s that made people fascinated with little people, specifically 
little people who dance around in funny costumes. They were already popular at the time with their acts in theater, vaudeville, and the circus, but Snow White and Oz made it even more globally mainstream. It is worth noting, however, that this phenomenon is a very dark example of the moral standards of that time. Since it was exploiting the stereotypes of dwarfism by presenting the dwarves and the munchkins as whimsical creatures like the ones you hear from all those fantasy stories that are cute and childlike instead of regular people. Even the way they were created for their respective films can be interpreted as the inferior compared to their average size female protagonists. Like the munchkins, with how their appearance and lifestyle goes beyond the realms of what was considered normal, or the dwarves with how the animators drew them the same way they would for cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, compared to the more realistic style of Snow White. But back to our story, speaking of the animators, Disney's team at that time were hard at work on their second feature, Pinocchio, based on the book by Carlo Collodi. By the time they were about done with the picture, Disney's executives took notice of the trend. And while it would have been repetitive to just bring out the dwarves again to capitalize their popularity, they got an idea on how they could use the little people to help promote their next movie. And with that personality, that profile, that physique, why, he's a natural-born actor. Hey, good <laughs> On February 7th, 1940, Pinocchio had its world premiere at the Center Theater in New York City. And to make the event stand out as a special occasion, along with taking advantage of the munchkin and dwarves phenomenon, Disney hired 11 little people to dress up as Pinocchio and place them on top of the marquee all day, where they danced around and greeted the audience as they entered to see Walt's next big picture. It was all going according to plan during the first few hours as the little Pinocchios were moving around and promoting the new movie, but it was a sunny day in New York, and all that dancing in those heavy costumes got them tired, hungry, and quite thirsty very quickly. When it was time for lunch, the people at Disney gave the 11 people a break where they can eat some food and have some drinks. However, the big catch from what they were given is that the only beverage they had was alcohol. What that was specifically is unclear, since my sources say different answers like beer or wine. But regardless, the only thing that the little people were drinking to quench their thirst was something with alcohol. Can we talk about some science for a sec? Well, well, hmm. quite a scholar I see. The reason alcohol makes you tipsy is because of a molecule that's inside all alcoholic drinks called ethanol. To put it simply, when consuming anything with alcohol, the ethanol will travel in the body to go to the areas where blood travels the most. It starts out in the liver, where they go through a cleaning process to make the molecule safe, but those that manage to bypass it will immediately go into the brain and mess with the system where the neurons don't function as well as they usually do. However, this process goes much faster when the drinker did not eat anything or drink something else like water, because the stomach doesn't have anything else to keep it in so it could digest, thus bringing in even more ethanol in the system and more to bypass the liver's cleaning process so that they can go straight into the brain and make the drunk sensation more potent. Also, how much alcohol it takes to make someone drunk varies from different individuals, since there's a ton of factors to consider like genetics, age, gender, weight, and size. In general, it depends on how much blood they have in their system. Because the less blood they need to carry, the quicker it is for the ethanol to travel straight into the brain. That's why a large person who's over six feet can drink more than someone skinnier who is under five feet. Why am I talking about all this? Because when you give 11 starving and dehydrated little people nothing but a large supply of alcohol to drink, that's when the chaos begins. Pinocchio! So this is where I find you. By 3 in the afternoon, the 11 little Pinocchios were totally drunk and all of their cares were completely gone. Oh, they're supposed to do their jobs and dance around all day? 
Nah, they don't feel like it anymore. They don't care. Oh, they're supposed to wear those Pinocchio costumes? Nah, it's too hot on that thing. They prefer to take them all off and get naked. They don't care. Oh, they're supposed to be mindful of everyone walking around New York City, especially the children since they're promoting a new family-friendly feature? Nah, they wanted to express whatever they want and let out all the swear words and burps for all of Manhattan to hear. They don't care. What was supposed to be a cheerful event to highlight Walt Disney's latest animated feature turned into an anarchic spectacle of 11 naked little people who were drunk out of their minds. Inevitably, the police were called to stop the madness, and when they got themselves on top of the marquee, the little people were playing craps, which fueled their loud nature. But when they saw the police officer coming up to their level, that was when their drunken party turned into drunken panic. Trying to stop the little people was proven to be a lot more difficult for the police than expected. Keep in mind that they weren't just drunk and naked, they were also sweaty from the sunny day and the costumes that they had to wear. So they could just slip away from the policeman's grasp. And it was at that moment when the cops decided that they were left with no choice. If the little people refused to cooperate and they couldn't just grab them, then they must resort to their drastic weapon to stop them once and for all. Pillowcases. And yes, they did exactly what you think they do. They snatched the little people in pillowcases like some cartoon kidnapper and brought them down while they were trapped inside. I don't know why or how the cops had pillowcases on hand for this occasion, but I guess in this case, whatever helped to control the situation was needed. Following the incident, while it received critical acclaim just like Snow White, the film unfortunately ended up as a box office bomb on its initial release. Of course, this had nothing to do with what happened at the premiere. If you haven't guessed from the date, it was actually because of World War II and how it completely closed off the European and Asian markets. Thankfully, once that was over, Pinocchio gradually found its fame over time and is now considered one of the greatest animated masterpieces, even if it didn't have a good start. For several reasons. Hmm. They like him. He's a success. Gosh, maybe I was wrong. Now, I want to be honest with you all. When I first discovered the story, I was a little bit upset. I previously chronicled the entire history of Disney animation and all of the movies that they have produced over the years. And part of me is kicking myself for not finding out about this little piece of history sooner to include that in the documentary. Because this must be among the craziest stories I've heard in Disney's history. Seriously, this is like one of those urban legends that get passed around for how insane it sounds. In fact, I wouldn't blame people for believing that this could be another Disney-themed urban legend. But it does raise a good question. Where did this story come from in the first place? Well, as I was going deeper into this rabbit hole and looking through my research, I eventually found what may be the original source of this story. It was from a 1975 book called Bring On The Empty Horses by British actor David Niven, where he reminisced about some of the oddball moments he experienced during the golden age of Hollywood. Surprisingly, the moment where he talked about the Pinocchio incident was in a small paragraph at the beginning. Now, keep in mind, that as it is from an older man in the 1970s, the vocabulary he used is outdated. But in the book, Niven stated, Walt Disney's publicity department had their problems too. For their opening of Pinocchio in New York, it was decided to hire 11 midgets, dress them in Pinocchio costumes, and have them gamble about on top of the theater marquee on opening day. Food and light refreshments in the shape of a couple of quarts of liquor was passed up to the marquee top at lunchtime, and by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a happy crowd in Times Square was treated to the spectacle of 11 stark naked midgets belching loudly and enjoying a crap game on the marquee. Police with ladders removed the players in pillowcases. However, there is a catch to this source. Niven had a reputation of always stretching the truth when he would discuss about what happened in his life. Even in his books like Bring On The Empty Horses and The Moon's A Balloon, 
David admitted that they were not completely accurate, and that he would tell stories about his life that were either true or completely made up. So, unfortunately, there may be a chance that this is just one of David Niven's tall tales meant to spice up his book. But I won't count this as completely fictional, though. Regardless of how accurate it may be, there is one piece of evidence that does prove many of the key components to this story. Allow me to present to you this picture. While it may not be the actual incident itself, it does show that what Disney set up for the premiere was true. It's the center theater presenting Pinocchio, which matches up to what it looked like during that day, and standing on the marquee are several little people dressed as Pinocchio greeting the New Yorkers. So, based on this photo alone, we can conclude that there is at least some truth to this story. What they can't do these days. Overall, what those 11 little people did on top of that marquee can be interpreted as how society treated those with dwarfism and many other marginalized groups. When they bear it all and make themselves unfiltered, it's a shocking and uncomfortable sight, and it leaves a gross stain in our history. But unlike a drunken, naked, sweaty little person, learning about the dark side of our history is necessary to ensure that we don't make the same discriminatory mistakes again to make massive changes and be more inclusive to those we once mistreated. When looking into the incident, I wouldn't necessarily blame the little people for what they did, since they were stuck with some bad working conditions and ended up on a drunken rampage because of the only substance Disney offered them. Even if that inebriated incident never actually happened, that still doesn't change how Disney exploited a discriminating phenomenon that they partly caused by having little people dance around in funny costumes for the sake of publicity. Fortunately, there's been a lot of progress since then in regards to how people with dwarfism are treated. But even at that, like many other human rights movements, there's still a long way to go. There's still those massive hurdles to cross to properly educate people and punish behavior that is fueled by hate, prejudice, and discrimination. Especially when there are still those that violently attack and slander anything that they don't understand and give them labels like woke instead of recognizing that the differences of others are harmless. In Walt Disney's Pinocchio, the movie teaches his audience that fate is kind and that she brings to those who love the sweet fulfillment of their secret longing. The wooden boy got his wish in the end because of the selfless act of helping Geppetto. And if we can do more of that to help those in need like little people or other marginalized groups, then we won't need to look up and wish upon a star to make our dreams come true. Then again, best not to look up in general or else you might risk seeing some Pinocchios letting out their Jiminy Crickets. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this crazy little story, um, no pun intended, then give this a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. It's been so long since I've made content like this, and it feels so good to be back on it. I promise you that there will be more to come. So, until next time, see you later, dudes! Make sure